Okay, welcome to volume 10 of the Bro Staff Bass Class, Going Deep, where we're going to cover some deep water bass techniques in depth, um, and also in the class in person. If you weren't able to show up um, at the restaurant the night of the class, I also went over some iPhone apps um, that really help us on the water, before we go on the water, planning a trip, how to decide where to go and why, especially this time of year as well. And I'm going to make another video on that. Um, so this one, I'm just going to go over the deep techniques because that one is a little harder to understand without actually capturing a lot of phone images and, and directions of how to get through the apps. So we're going to go over the, the deep water bass techniques in this one. And then I'm going to make another video that'll talk all about the technology stuff. So don't worry about that. Let's get into the going deep. So what I'm going to cover is why we as bass fishermen first head out for deep water. Um, this is basically for the summertime period. Um, and then once we're out there and once we know we want to fish deep, <clears throat> we want to fish offshore, what are some soft plastic setups um, in very particulars? And what are some hard bait setups you can use in very particulars about them too? So we're going to go into all that. We're going to get started with why do we go out deep? So bass fishermen, I'm guilty of it. Everybody's guilty of it. You'd rather fish shallow. Most bass fishermen would rather fish shallow. Visible cover, fun fishing around trees and grass and docks and, and riprap and things like that. So there are a lot of reasons why you don't want to go out to the main channel or you don't want to get off the bank enough and turn your back to the bank and fish something that you quote unquote can't see. You know, you'd rather fish shallow. You don't have a good enough depth finder. There's too much boat traffic out on the main channel and it's boring. It's a slow way of fishing. Well, we're going to get rid of all that. I was guilty of that before. I'm not guilty of that now. And I want to help you guys get over all this mess too. So why we go out deep, when you talk about just the natural conditions of all our reservoirs, and this will change a little bit based on where you are. We're here in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, and we have a lot of southern warm water reservoirs. They've got small creeks feeding them. They've got a big old dam. They've got a nice you know, deep water section near the dam. They usually have a smaller, more natural area up in the river portion of it, but most of the time, reservoirs around at least the east and the south are going to be very similar. In the spring, the temps are in the 50s and 60s, and the oxygen is well mixed. The fish are loving life. They're happy. They're up there spawning. They're not really limited about where they can travel. You will catch fish in 3 feet of water, and you'll also slide out and catch fish in 10 to 12 feet of water. In spring, they're stoked. They're loving it. They're happy. They're up. They're feeding. They're getting ready to spawn, or they are spawning. Spring's a great time. And then as we warm up in early summer, we have some warmer, longer days. So the water starts warming up rapidly. And here in Charlotte, we'll get a spurt where we have some 80 degree days really fast where it jumps our water temperature up five degrees in a week. It's happened. We see it happen all the time. So your temps are coming up from those awesome little spawning periods where you're looking for 62, 64 degree water to go bed fish and catch those big females up shallow. And then all of a sudden, in blink of an eye, the next time you get to go fishing, it's 71, 72 degree water. To me, that means I get to go fish top water now, so I'm happy about that. But the fish are going to start changing a little bit once that water starts really warming up. So your oxygen is still okay because warmer water cannot hold as much oxygen as cooler water. It's starting to get a little tough, you know, with the warmer water coming on, especially if you get a super hot day. And so what happens in the water that, that changes your oxygen dynamics is during the daytime, all your little phytoplankton, your little algae, your little critters that you can't see without a microscope that are creating photosynthesis during the day are putting out tons of oxygen. So during the day, you're, you're what we call is super saturated. There is more oxygen being put out by these little guys than the water can even hold. So some of it is bubbling up and you'll see it in the foam. Sometimes it comes up through the, the water through a prop wash when it's really, really warm and sunny. And that's completely natural. These guys are doing their job. And at night, it's just the opposite. They're doing respiration. So they're eating that oxygen up and they're pumping out CO2, carbon dioxide, 
which is why you normally have your fish kills overnight. Most of the time, when a, a person finds a fish kill in a pond or on the edge of the water of the, of the lake where it's a small lake or something like that, they'll find it the next day. They won't see it occur during the day. It happens overnight when all these little guys are using up the oxygen they were putting out the, the day before. So that's why the sunnier, the hotter, the warmer everything gets, the more these algae grow, the more they're doing this crazy up and down dynamic and sometimes it causes a fish kill and it causes fish to change their behavior. So when the midsummer dog days get here, the thermocline comes into play. And what the thermocline is there on the screen is the break line between where the cooler and the warmer water won't mix. And it's typically right there where the last bit of oxygen is where the fish can combine the cooler water and the oxygen to fit exactly where they want to be. They're angry, they're cold-blooded, they want to be in a cool place, not up there in sunshine, but they also want to have enough oxygen. So there's a there's a good balance there. They're going to slide out. And if you've got a depth finder and you watch it good enough in the summertime, you'll see, at least around here, that 20 to 25 to 30 foot range seems to be where we have our thermocline every year. Again, different reservoirs will change, but more often than not, in the dog days of summer, if you turn your Lorance on, you turn your hummingbird on, and you look, you'll see shad, whatever other type of bait fish, pelagic game fish like white perch, crappy, striper, largemouth, spotted bass. You'll see them find a level in that water column that they like and they're consistently at, and that's typically where your thermocline is, and typically where your oxycline is, which is also basically saying where your huge drop off in oxygen is, where they can't go any further down. There's just not enough oxygen for them to have. So that's why these fish slide out a little deeper. Your hot 80 plus degree water has good oxygen during the day. We just talked about that. The algae are up there doing their job, but it's really unstable. It can be turbid from your thunderstorms and your oxygen's going crazy because of that daytime, nighttime thing. So they can find more stable, cooler water out. And largemouth will pull out. They'll get out there and they'll use that thermocline area as long as they can find something to eat. And if they can slide up there in the morning and eat a bluegill, if they can chase down some shad, which a lot of your smaller fish will do, they'll gang up and just destroy the shad this time of year. But they're going to try to find cool water that's suitable to their bodies, that also has enough oxygen around it, and food. So if you can find that combination on your body of water and you can run it enough, you can typically run into some good fishing that other guys are missing. So again, in summer dog days, right now in July and August in the south, in reservoirs, this might be different in Florida where it's really shallow all the time and warm, or it might be very different up in Canada or up in you know the, the Midwest where they never really get warm enough. But here in the south, in the early morning, in the late evening, and at night, during the midsummers, you can find fish shallow. They're moving around. They're in that cooler water. When it cools down in the morning, they can move around. But as soon as it gets into the midday, you're going to see those fish pull out. All those fish you were catching on top water in the morning have pulled out. That water's hot. That sun is beating down. They don't like it. They're not comfortable. They're going to slide out. They're going to find some cooler water that they like where it has shad that they can feed on whenever they want to. And that's where you're looking at your graph really, really helps. So they want to be comfortable and around their food, just like we do. So if they can get comfortable and have their food right there with them, there's really no reason for them to leave. Bass come up shallow for two reasons. That's to eat and to make babies. That is absolutely it. So they're not making babies right now in August. And if they can eat out deep and stay in the air conditioning, they will. So you better go try to find their air conditioning if you can, if you're struggling up shallow to catch some bass. So how are we going to get to them? The first rigs we're going to go over are soft plastic rigs. Probably the number one over the past couple decades, deep water soft plastic rig has been a Carolina rig. Uh, that is getting 
chased right now by a drop shot. Guys are learning how to fish a drop shot really well with a depth finder and without to catch fish out deep. It's a very, very good technique. We'll go over it in a second. And then you have something like a football jig or the hardhead jig um, that uh, Tommy Biffle designed. Something completely different for fishing out deep. I'll go over it as well. A shaky head slash Ned rig that's heavy enough to get out deep. Excellent technique. A new one on scene, the Nico rig, which I've dabbled with a little bit, but a lot of the pros are doing really well with out deep. And then a simple swim bait grub or flute. And we'll go over each one of these in depth. So your Carolina rig, real basic. Everybody's been fishing this for years. It's going to have some key variables that make a difference. We're going to go over each one of these in depth. But your key variables, when you're going to build a Carolina rig, when you go to the store and you're going to buy a Carolina rig setup, is your weight, size, and shape, the leader length you use, and the material that leader is made from, and the bait shape, size, action, and the hook you use. All this makes a big difference, and we'll tell you why in a second. So your weight. You can go to tungsten versus lead. Tungsten is going to be more expensive. It's going to be smaller in size for its weight versus lead. But it's very, very hard. So if you're fishing an area where you really need to tell the difference between a sandy bottom and a hard bottom, or pea gravel versus just river bottom, you probably want to go to tungsten. It's going to relate that to your rod and to your hands better than lead is. Lead is softer. Now, you still may be able to feel a little bit of difference with the lead, but if you really, really, really want to know what the changes are on the bottom, you probably ought to go to tungsten. It's probably about four or five times more expensive than lead, so keep that in mind, but it does have its place. The shape of your Carolina rig weight is important based on where you're Carolina rigging. If you're going to come through grass, which a lot of people don't Carolina rig through grass, but it can be done, it has been done, and it will work, you don't want a bulky egg sinker coming through the grass you want a bullet sinker however if you're going to be on a hard bottom dragging off a point dragging off a big flat the egg sinker is going to do better because it doesn't have a pointed nose it's round it's going to roll over those things a little better and then you have a little finesse tech weight there the little cylinder weights and they're kind of a mix between the two so they're round but they're slender so they'll kind of do either one the issue is they're still very skinny, so if you come through rocks and stuff like that, you're going to hang up with it. It's just a smaller presentation. It doesn't bulk up as much and look quite as fake. I haven't had a ton of applications for the Finesse Tech weights, but they are out there, the little cylinder weights. More often than not, I'm throwing an egg sinker. The decision to use a bead or not, that is a personal decision based on what you think you need between that weight and your swivel to protect your knot or to make noise. A plastic bead is not going to be quite as loud as a glass bead. However, if you use a glass bead, it's more likely to shatter and crack a little bit and it could cut your line. So there's a give and take in everything in fishing. So if you want to use a bead and you want to make as much noise as you can, but you're worried about cutting your line with a glass bead, then I'd probably add another plastic bead just to make a little more noise for you. That's if you want to use a bead at all. Personally, I do not. I don't know that it's hurt me or not, but a lot of guys use them. Give it a shot and see what you think. And make sure your Carolina rig weight is heavy enough. Um, this is also going to depend on your bait style, which we'll talk about in a sec, but you don't want to be struggling to, to wait and let that rig get down so if you're going to fish between 10 and 20 feet you probably don't need anything more than a half to a three quarter if you're going to go 20 to 30 to 35 40 feet deep you probably need to go up to that ounce area to, to get it down to keep it down where you want it just make sure your weight is heavy enough to do the job you want it to do your leader length believe it or not, will make a big difference as well. And thinking about this, you know, if, if you haven't before, 
when you look at it like this, it makes perfect sense. The shorter the leader is, the more responsive your bait's going to be to your rod tip action. Whether you're twitching it, dragging it, hopping it, whatever you like to do with your Carolina rig, your bait is going to be more responsive because there's not as much slack or distance from your swivel, which you're, you're really moving the swivel. When you do this work, the weight and the swivel are the ones doing the work. The bait just follows. And so knowing that, if you need more action out of your bait and more manual action than just it falling on its own and it following behind the weight, then a shorter leader might help you. However, if you're worried about the fish spooking off the rig, if you're worried about it um, hugging too close to the bottom, falling too fast to the bottom, whatever, you may want to stretch out to a longer leader. I think guys use a longer leader more to get the worm or the bait itself separate from the rig, from the weight and the snap and the swivel and all those things. Um, <clears throat> and that's fine. It seems to work really well. I usually use about a foot and a half leader, sometimes a two foot. Um, my dad usually uses about a 10 to 12 inch leader and that's it, if that, and does just fine. So just know that the distance of your leader can greatly impact how your bait moves, how fast it goes to the bottom, and whether or not it stays down there a lot more locked or a lot more free, depending on what you do. Then the material your leader's made with, and we've talked about the different types of line already in the multiple applications and why they're good and why they're bad, but this is just a basic layup <clears throat> of the difference in the leader material you'd like to use. With mono, it's what I had used for a long time. I think I'm actually still using it right now um, on my Carolina rig. I haven't thrown my Carolina rig in about a month. Um, it's going to float a little bit more, so it's not going to plummet to the bottom once the weight hits. It's going to kind of bag in the water column, especially if you use heavier mono because it, it really, it's thicker, so it's going to bag in the water column a lot and not just plummet to the bottom, but it's going to have stretch to it. So just know that if you have a thick bait with a thicker shanked hook, it's going to take a lot more pressure to pull that hook into the fish's mouth. You know, mono is going to stretch some, so you have to be aware of that. However, fluorocarbon, which has little stretch at all, sinks like a rock. So it's kind of a give and take kind of thing. It's, it's going to fall on down to the bottom. It's not going to have quite as much lift and quite as much flow when you're fishing the bait, when you're fishing the Carolina rig on the bottom, but it doesn't have any stretch. So your hook set's going to be pretty good. When you hit them, they're going to feel it. And then braid. I don't know anybody that fishes braid as a leader. It does float very well. It has zero stretch, but is extremely visible. So most of the time, a Carolina rig is a sight bait. Um, I think if you do use a brush hog or, you know, a lizard or something like that with some movement to it, that it will help in dirty water. But um, I think it, it, they would very much see your line. So as long as you're cool with that, then you'll be good to go. Braid is not going to break. It's not going to be quite as, um, quite as, as, I guess thick is your mono or your fluorocarbon, so you would be able to get away with a smaller diameter, but it's going to have very little stretch, and when you hit the fish, you better be ready to have some drag slip a little bit so you don't pull it out of his mouth on the fight end, but just different reasons to fish the different types of line, really no different from anything else you'd use these three lines for, it's just the implications of how they behave on a Carolina rig right here. So, your bait choice makes a difference as well. And not only for the forage you're trying to mimic, or the size, but how much you want it to act, quote unquote, on the fall, and then on the retrieve. So, a straight, do-nothing style bait like a Senko, like a Trick Worm, or like that Super Fluke Junior right there, are they're going to go straight to the bottom. There's not going to be any action hardly at all on the fall or when it's just sitting there. 
when you pull it, it's still not going to have a ton of action. There's no legs, there's no curly tails, there's no, you know, ribbon tail or anything like that to make movement. So it's a very subtle, natural presentation, which is great for clear water. On the fall, again, nothing. It's going to drop straight down in a do-nothing style. When you move it, all the action it's getting is from your rod tip. However, when you go to something on the right side of the screen, like an ultra-vibe speed crawl, a brush hog, or a zoom lizard, they're going to have a lot of action on the fall and a lot of action when you pull them. They're going to call fish to them with their movement, with their thump, their curl, their, their wiggle, all that. And it'll also slow the fall of the Carolina rig more than the fluke trick worm and Cinco did on the left side of the screen. So a lot of things to think about. If you want the action to go down through the water column, it's going to take it a little while longer to get down there. And then it's going to try to lift a little bit more when you pull it. Those curly tails are going to lift that bait up a little bit off the bottom. Whereas the other baits on the left up there, the worm, the fluke, and the Cinco, uh, they're going to pretty much just stay on the bottom. They don't have any action to yank them up at all. So things to keep in mind. And the worms down there on the bottom left are kind of in between. They've got a little bit of action, but they're still natural looking. So typically, that's where I start. If, unless I know I'm in a tough condition where the fish are real negative and the water's really clear, and then I'm going to go to a trick worm or a Senko. Every once in a while, I'll try a fluke. But more often than not, I'm going to start down there in the left bottom corner with an Ultra Vibe Speed Worm, a Zoom 4-inch Dead Ringer, or that Strike King Rage Thumper Worm right there is a new one, and see what's going on. If you know they're eating crawfish or you know a lizard is a hot bait, that's fine. Go start there. But I'm typically going to start with some kind of action worm to see what's going on. And if they stop biting and that water's clear and those fish are negative, I'm going to slide up the screen to the left corner and try something very natural and subtle before I go to the aggravators on the right over there. If you're in dirty water, fish are aggressive, Start on the right side. Get those ultra vibe speed crawls, the brush hogs, and the lizards ready to go, <coughs> and then change if you need to. But your bait choice makes a big difference as well. So the drop shot. Very popular now in clear water. Extremely popular with smallmouth fishermen in the north. Um, every bass will eat it. You catch largemouth on it, spots on it. You could probably catch striper on it if you really tried. It'll catch pretty much anything depending on how you fish it. Its key variables are very similar in that it's still a weight and a hook. The weight, size, and the shape come into play in a different way. The leader length is important. Now we're starting to talk about whether or not you fish it weedless or you fish it with an open hook. And then the bait, shape, size, and action again makes a difference, of course. So your drop shot weights are, can be as complicated or as not complicated as you want. When I first started drop shot fishing years ago, back in 2004, I just had an old Bell Bass Casting weight over there on the right. You can get about eight or nine of them for a dollar and something at Walmart, and they do just fine. And drop shotting got more popular, and drop shotting got more particular and finesse and so we started designing these weights you see in the middle which have a fast clip on them which is you just pinch your line in there and that way you can change the distance your weight and your hook are apart very quickly without cutting and retying great idea a little more expensive than the bass casters for sure especially if you go to tungsten but talking about the shape if you're going to be fishing a lot of rocks a lot of rocks then you want to go with the more cylinder shape because instead of pulling it along the bottom like you were doing the Carolina rig, now you're fishing this as a vertical rig. So that weight is going to be picked up out of the rocks. It's not going to be drugged down into them. However, if you really want to feel what's on the bottom, this guy doesn't do a very good job of that, the cylinder shaped one, because it's going to fall onto its side and when you pick it up, it's going to keep flopping back and forth. It's going to come up and down out of the rocks. Great. But you're not going to get that solid feel of the bottom like you would the little tungsten ball weight on the right. If it's <clears throat> if it's that important to you, more power to you. I use a bass cast and sinker. I don't drop shot very, very, very much. But when I do, I really don't worry about what the bottom composition is. Those smallmouth guys up north do. If they find a shell bed and they find it with that drop shot, they mark it and they fish the snot out of it. So, again, just like with the Carolina rig, 
If you really want to feel what's going on in the bottom, try some tungsten, spend the money, and keep in mind what shape you want. If you're going to fish some riprap, you're going to fish some rocky points, stay away from that ball weight and get that cylinder. It'll do a good job all around, but the ball weight will really, really tell you what's down there. So you lead a length. It, it makes a difference here too. The longer your leader, the further you are from the bottom and the more ability you have to let that bait fall. So when you rig up a drop shot, whether you have a straight tail worm on it, a grub, a fluke, whatever you're doing, your weight's going to go down first and drag the hook with it. Once the weight hits and it's come to rest, you have this downtime where you can either immediately start holding that bait tight straight out, straight up and down with your rod tip, or you can still let the slack go. And once that weight has hit, the weight of the hook and the bait itself are going to come on down nice and easy and slow. And sometimes that's the action it takes to get bit around a dock, around some inactive fish. It's something they don't see very much. It, at least for me, when I drop shot fish, I try to make sure that I think about what that worm is doing the entire time I'm fooling with my rod tip. So having a longer leader is going to keep that worm up off the bottom further but it's going to give you that ability to let it fall and then hop back up and fall and hop back up. The shorter you keep a leader, the closer to the bottom. And if you're on some fish that are dead on the bottom, the more apt you're going to be to stay in their face the whole time. This is situation specific. If you're in open water trying to find fish or around dock trying to find fish, I would go with a little bit longer leader. And we're talking something like a foot and a half, maybe two feet at most. If you're fishing around fish you know that are locked to the bottom and you want to flip the drop shot to them, maybe go to a foot, if not six to eight inches. Situational, again, depends on what you're doing, but that does make a difference. So keep that in mind when you're rigging up your drop shot. So your hook rigging. Mm. Personal preference comes into play here, but as a rule... If you're going to open hook, nose rig, or wacky rig, you're going to get a better hookup. They're going to come eat the bait. It's usually a soft worm or a shad style imitator or something like that. And by the time they've already swam off and you felt them eat, all you need to do is a nice tight load on the rod. And that hook's going to go in. Most of these hooks are really thin wired. So they're going to go right in the mouth of the fish with his own weight. But... If you're wanting to fish around brush piles, if you're wanting to flip around wood or docks or things like that, that hook is going to hang up a whole lot more than the one to the right, which is your EWG style weedless hook. Now, you don't have to use an EWG if you do this. You can use an offset shank or even a straight shank for that matter. But I'm just illustrating that a weedless hook is going to come through cover better. However, if you do hit a fish, you're going to have to pull that worm weight or that worm hook through the plastic and into the fish's mouth harder than you did with that little open octopus hook there on the left. So again, it's a give and take. Just know your situation. You know if you're going to flip a weightless style drop shot around cover, the, the hook set needs to be a little better. But if you're fishing the open hook, let them eat it, let them swim off, let the weight of the hook or where the weight of the fish lay the hook into the fish's mouth and you'll load up a lot cleaner and a lot better. So again, give and take, but as a rule, open water, I would fish a wacky style or a nose hook with an open hook rig. Fishing around cover like brush piles and lay downs and docks that might have some gnarly stuff around it. Go ahead and get you some small weedless hooks to use for drop shotting and try it and see if you like it. So your bait options. Most of the time, it's going to be some type of straight, subtle bait. Um, a power minnow, a robo worm, a dream shot. I started with a centipede. That little green thing in the middle right there is the first thing I ever drop shot fished and caught a ton of bass on it. Um, trick worm is another great one. It's got a lot of subtle movement in it. Very small, finessey looking worm. But you can use some action style baits 
for this new kind of technique that's coming around, which is cranking and dragging a drop shot. So basically what you would do is you would get a weedless EWG or an offset shank hook and you'd tie your drop shot up and you'd rig these the little swim bait there, the key tech swim bait there on the right or the four inch dead ringer below it and you would just wind it and let the drop shot weight tell the swim bait or the worm how far off the bottom he's going to be. So your leader will then determine how far off the bottom your little shad or worm are going to swim the whole time. Interesting new way of fishing a drop shot. I hadn't played with it too much. I kind of stick with the stuff on top of the screen there more often than not. Change it up a little bit. I fish a crawl every once in a while, but more often than not, it's either a robo worm, a zoom centipede, or that zoom trick worm right there that's going to get it. You need to think about your buoyancy as well. Uh, if you're going to use some stuff like a Z-Man plastic or something like that, it's going to hold the bait straight out the whole time and, and sit up so when you let go of your slack after your weight has hit, it's not going to fall. Whereas all the other soft plastics that aren't Elastec and floatable, they're going to do that fall. So think about all these crazy things when you start figuring out what you're going to drop shot with. End all be all though, a Zoom Finesse Worm, a Robo Worm, about a four and a half to six inch worm with robo worm, whatever color you like, or go get some old zoom centipedes. You'd be surprised what'll eat it. So your football jig, kind of a hard, kind of a soft plastic. I kind of stuck it in there, but mainly because of the hard head, the biffle hard head I'm going to talk about in a second. But again, your weight is very key, how heavy you have it. Your hook size is going to come into play here now, whether you have a skirted jig or a clean jig, and then your bait shape, size, and action. Let's start into that. So the bait on the far right started me into this journey. That is a Biffle Bug hardhead combination. Tommy Biffle invented it. He did it for fishing offshore and fishing it fast. So it's a football-style weight that's hinged to a hook that basically lets it crawl over the bottom really fast. So you're talking half ounce and up. With these other jigs, like the football jig there in the middle with the with the, the green hula grub on it, and the skirted football jig there as well, they're mainly flipped out real deep and drug over rocks. That's why the football head was designed. It was meant to come through rocks really well. Now we've got a lot of different choices of football style heads, like this weedless shaky head you see right here, bottom right, and then obviously the hard head itself. You can put any plastic you want now on a football head. It's, it's become a staple of people fishing offshore now is to get some football heads for dragon crawls or worms or anything on the bottom. So your weight needs to be strong enough, again, similar to your Carolina rig to keep it down. I like from 10 to 15 foot, a half ounce. Over in that, you're gonna go up to a three quarters. The guys that fish real deep with football jigs down in Texas and places like that, they're going up to an ounce. So I would look at a half ounce football jig, see if you like that and see if you need to move up. And then pick what you want. If you The hook size is gonna change mainly on the hard head based on how big or small of a worm or crawl you're going to use. <coughs> you can find some small tungsten football jigs that are skirted that you can use out deep, but more often than not, the hook size on your on your football jigs are going to be similar. They're going to be your normal 3 aught jig hook, a big beefy jig hook with a great weed guard. You're coming through brush and cover out deep. So kind of line up your skirted jig with the weight and then knowing how deep you're going to fish before you go out there, you'll probably find that it takes more weight than you think to stay as deep as you want. And I found that out myself when I started. So a skirted jig versus a clean jig. A skirted jig is going to fall slower than a clean jig will. So that skirted jig in the middle there, the, the orange pumpkin one, versus the Biffle Hardhead on the far right, 
they're going to fall in different rates because of their displacement of water. So if you want it to fall slow, you're, you're good. You could even add more skirts to that thing to let it fall even slower. However, if you want it to fall real fast, you may want to think about going to something like the hard head like that. It's going to pull it down a lot faster and not have that skirt flared to slow it down. And then your bait shape, your size, and your action comes into play. That twin tail green grub right there, that hula grub, is going to have action all the way down, but it's going to fall a lot slower. And then when you pull it, it's going to have a lot of action, a lot of flop, and it's not going to look quite as natural as just a crawl trailer. So think about the action of your trailer, the realism of your trailer, how it's going to affect the fall of your jig, how it's going to be affected when you drag it, hop it, let it sit still. Think about all these different things. Typically, the dirtier the water, the less visibility, the further out deep. I want something that's going to move a little bit. So that's why you don't see any natural little pincher crawl looking baits on here. You're going to see the hula grub and you're going to see that biffle bug, which has a good bit of action on the drag as well. An ultra vibe speed crawl would be another great one. Or a Berkeley chigger crawl as well. But I'm going to be moving this thing out deep and grinding it on the bottom. And you're going to lose some jigs. Just go ahead and get ready for that. Because when you hang up, it's not going to be where you can see it. Odds are your hook retriever may not even get that deep if you get one from Bass Pro Shop. So just be ready to get frustrated and hang up a little bit. But it's a fun way of fishing out in open water and offshore on points that not a ton of people are doing around me right now. So it may put fish in the boat for you if you try it where you are. Oh, the old shaky head and the Ned Rig. Super popular right now everywhere. The Ned Rig, good grief, catches fish all over the place. Shaky head's been around years now, probably, probably a decade or more. Um, all you're going to do here with your shaky head and your Ned Rig is you're going to upsize your weights a little bit or know your expectations, know your limitations with how you can really fish a light setup. The Ned Rig, more often than not, you're going to be fishing like a tenth, an eighth, and sometimes the weight that I fish is a sixth ounce. I like a sixth. I can get down deeper, but I keep that small little hook and that small little profile. If, if you're wanting to fish deeper than that, it's going to be a little hard to fish a Ned Rig that deep. I, I would say a Ned Rig would be good out to 15 20 max and then it's just not enough weight you can't feel it you can't stay on it enough to fish it whereas with your shaky heads they make shaky heads up to three eighths and a half ounce now so you can find a shaky head that'll work for you they may make a mushroom head with a small hook that's up to three eighths to a half ounce i haven't seen it all my ned rigs go up to a sixth of an ounce and that's as far as they go other than that i'm gonna fish a shaky head for sure um, the thread versus the spring keeper. Some guys say that the spring keeper causes them to miss fish. It doesn't let the nose of the worm move out of the way when you're setting the hook. I haven't had that issue. I've fished spot removers for a long time. I've fished some other lucky strike shaky heads with a spring on them. I haven't had an issue with it at all, but some guys are funny about it. So they like to use the thread method, which basically means you put it on like a Texas rig and thread it up like the, uh, the Ned rig there on the right, very far right of the screen, has a, um, a weedless hook design on it. Eat your own. You find a shaky head you like, you stick with it because it, it's it's not hard to build confidence with it. If you get around a set of docks or something like that to build confidence in a company and in a style that you like. But out deep, you're going to basically fish these the same way. Um, your bait, shape, and size and action still come into play. The smaller and the do-nothing that it is, the faster it's going to fall. If you do like to put a little curly tail worm on your shaky head, just know it's going to slow it down. So it's going to keep it from getting down there quite as fast. And it's going to raise a little bit as you fish it on the bottom. So it's going to loft it in the air or into the top of the water a little bit as you make it, you know, come through the retrieve. But you can use the same worms you've been using the whole time around docks. You can use a little bit bigger worm if you're looking for a bigger fish out deep, but if you take an Ed rig, just like that one in the picture, and a shaky head, just like that one in the picture, on a 25-foot point, you can get them down there efficiently, you'll catch fish on them. They'll see them, they'll come over, and they'll eat them off the bottom. They may eat it on the fall, just like they do around docks. It's really no different at all. So it's a great option to have. Is it the most efficient? Maybe not, because typically they're lighter. But if you're only going to be fishing 15, 20, 25 feet, 
you could absolutely do it with these guys. Again, you need to think about your buoyancy. If you're going to be using the Ned rig that is made by Z-Man with the Z-Man plastics, it does flow straight up and down. So that's the profile you're going to be giving off when you're on the bottom out deep, even like you do up shallow. And if you don't use a plastic that's extremely buoyant, just know it's going to be laying flat. And when you hop it, it'll be vertical for a minute. And then at that deeper water, it's going to lay right back down. So just keep that in mind when you're deciding about your shaky head and your Ned rig baits as well. Both of these can be fished out deep, though, easily. Spotted bass love both of them as well. Unico rig. This one's kind of a mix between a wacky rig and a Ned rig, kind of the way it behaves. So the key variables here, again, just about like all of them are your hook type, whether you're going to use a weedless versus an open hook, the weight size and type, the bait shape, size and action you're going to use, and you're going to again decide about buoyancy. So when you're rigging a Nico rig, you're basically adding a weight to the worm or to the crawl or to the plastic you're going to be using. And then you're hooking it in the middle, not in the front, not in the back. You're kind of hooking it about in the middle of the bait. And that's going to give it kind of a, a bending wacky action. But the nose is always going to stay down. So it's a unique look where the tail is up and the nose is down or... In the instance of the crawl, his tail is up and his pinchers are, or his tail is down and his pinchers are up. So you can manipulate this thing in a bunch of different ways. We have not completely delved into what you can do with a Nico rig. But if you hear somebody talk about what a Nico rig is, it is a octopus or kale style small hook, wacky rigged into a soft plastic that has an exterior weight like a little weight that's added to it up through the nose to make one end of that bait go down while the other one stays up you're going to want to fish this again on about the same line as you do a drop shot or a shaky head slash ned rig light spinning tackle unless you go real heavy real beefy which i don't think you will because of those hooks that are designed for them are really light wire so I would look at something like your shaky head, your drop shot, and your Ned rig setup, and just play with different baits. There's a fluke stick there on the left, um, a Senko in the middle, and that's a, a Yamamoto crawl there on the right. So you can play with anything with this. A finesse worm would look just as good. Um, it's going to be a nose down presentation with the other part of the bait flopping, sticking up in the water. So something new, something different. Um, easy to fish, um, pretty much no wrong, wrong way to fish. And once it hits bottom, you're going to basically give all the action to the bait through your rod tip. Um, and they do hit it on the fall a good bit. I do know that as well. So something fun, something different to try. Nico rig. I hadn't played with it enough. I hope to do it a little bit more here soon. And then your swim bait grub and fluke. Old Casey Ashley threw that underspin right there down at uh i think it was hartwell when the classic was down there it was real cold that year and slaughtered them uh in one ditch just crushed the fish that winter using an underspin if you're going to fish deep the key there is you know the weight of that jig head but then whether or not you're going to do a weedless or an open hook type so you can get by with a weedless rig out there if you're fishing deep. The issue is sometimes these fish slap at these baits a whole lot, and I like having an open hook. You're going to lose some baits, but I love having an open hook. And most of the jigs that you'll be fishing with this really don't come in a weedless manner. They come in a jig head manner. So you're going to want to make sure you adjust the weight size of your jig head against the action of your bait again because the action in the tail of that swim bait there on the right of the swimming fluke there on the left on the bottom and that fat albert grub right there on the bottom right are going to cause that rig to loft some more they're going to come up in the column and if you want them to stay down you need to overload them a little bit with some jig head weight um the super flukes at the top don't do anything to that jig head. They're just going to hang there and look natural like a bait fish. 
all the action has to be either imparted by that cool little spinner there on the underspin or in your rod tip with your wrist. That is what you're going to do. You're going to impart all the action on that flute because it's not going to do anything but sit there. So, again, the bait shape, size, and action dictate what you want. Typically, a slow, steady retrieve on your little boot tail and your um, underspin there will get it done. You can burn some stuff out deep if you have enough weight. Most of the time, it's going to be a slow and steady retrieve or a pump and drop retrieve out deep. With the, uh, the one little jig head there on the top right, the moon eye jig with the fluke on it, that's going to be strictly a, a twitch and jerk and pump situation. You're going to hop it, hop it up and let it fall, or you're going to put it right in front of the fish's mouth and sit there and jiggle it until he eats it. So it's almost like a jig head version of a drop shot. Um, they've been doing really well with that open water small mouth over the past couple of years. And uh, I've tried it a little bit around here, and more often than not, it's really, really good in schooling fish. If you know they're going up and down and up and down real fast on shad, it's something that's really efficient that gets bit really well up on top or deep. So think about that next time you're looking at a fluke. You can throw it on a jig head, even though it doesn't have any action in the tail, and you can do really well with it in open water out deep. Again, you're going to want to decide about buoyancy that's going to keep that bait lofted up. So just know that. Just know anytime you're trying to go deep at what the soft plastic you're using is going to do to prevent you from staying deep and adjust accordingly. So now we'll take a break from the soft plastics and talk about your hard baits. So we're going to go over a jig and spoon, a flutter spoon, a jig and wrap, which is a cool new ice bait for me. I'm going to learn how to fish it here in the next coming months if I can find some open fish. A blade bait, a deep diving crankbait, and a lipless crankbait. Old jig and spoon saved me a many a day on the water when the fish are out deep. Main keys of your jig and spoon is how heavy it is and the size of the spoon itself the shape of the spoon, and then your color pattern as well. So the jig and spoon basically is probably one of the most efficient shad imitators that you can have because of the weight of it versus the size of it really, really helps you key in on those thread fin shad lakes. The little cotton cordell spoon on the right corner there in the top is by far the most efficient fish catching machine I've used in middle of summer and dead of winter than anything else I've fished. Um, it mimics those thread fin shad extremely well in our area. Uh, you're going to want to have a spoon that falls accordingly to your depth. If you're going to be fishing 15 to 20 feet, you don't need anything that's an ounce. That's going to fall too fast. It's not going to get down to where the fish are in a slow, fluttering manner. It's not what you want to do. I would look at fishing about a quarter to a three-eighths ounce spoon, maybe a half in that 15 to 20. Over 20, you're going to go from a half on up. That That's where you'll start getting a little deeper, and you want that spoon to be a little bit more efficient on the fall. As far as the shape, um, the old Castmaster there on the left, if you'll notice, has a bevel to it, and it's going to make a different flutter. Um, whereas the Chunky Monkey Spoon on the right there, the blue one, it's going to look completely different. It's more of a slab type spoon. It's got a belly. It's got an actual bait fish shape to it instead of just, you know, an actual flat hammered piece of lead. So looking at the different shapes that you have to mimic the forage you have, again, and the size. So you want your spoon to be about the size of your thread fins. And if you've got, you know, good size, three, three and a half inch thread fin shad around, find, you can find you a spoon that looks just like that. It's when you get up to those really big bait fish, like your alewives and your river herring and things like that, your bluebacks that it really comes into play that you need a bigger spoon, but maybe not one that falls straight down. So the way you're going to fish a jig and spoon is you're going to drop it, let it go to a desired depth, whether that's the bottom or not, and you're going to snap your rod tip up and let it flutter back down while following it down with your rod tip on a semi-slack line. When you jerk it up and then it starts dying and falling back down is usually when you're going to get your bite. 
So a jig and spoon is a faster, straight up, herky jerky, straight down kind of pattern. Whereas a flutter spoon is just the opposite of that. When you throw this guy out there, he is a concave, basically a dinner spoon that's been stretched out. A big old concave scoopy spoon that's going to flutter way to the left and way to the right as it falls, depending on how wide it is, how long it is, how much slack you give your line. The flutter spoon spends more time falling and fluttering in the water than the jigging spoon does, which can be good or bad depending on how deep you're fishing. So your key variables here, again, are your weight and your size. I like anywhere from a three-quarter to an ounce and a half flutter spoon, and we're talking big stuff. So we're talking five and six inch spoons that to us look huge but a five inch shad is nothing for a two or three pound fish i mean think about that so a little intimidating but i've had some experience this past year with them and i'm starting to learn them i'm gonna make myself learn them they take a special setup though they're pretty heavy like i said three quarters to an ounce and a half so you're gonna look at fishing a heavy action rod with at least some 17 to 20 to 25 pound, you know, either fluorocarbon or mono. I'm throwing mine on 20 pound fluorocarbon and it's doing really well. Um, most flutter spoons are the same shape. They're mostly this long, elaborate scoop of a spoon. Some have feathered treble, some don't. And then just match your color pattern. A plain chrome one is fine. If you have some stain in your water, go with a gold one. Um, if you know they're eating a specific thing, you can try to match that a little bit, but more often than not, it's the action and the flash of the bait that gets it bit and where you fish it. So what you're going to do with him, <coughs> kind of the same thing with the jigging spoon is you're going to find a targeted depth. You're going to pitch him out there, throw him out there and let him go down to that. And you're going to pump him up real hard. And what's going to happen is that spoon's going to shoot up off the bottom, however far you've jerked him. And then he's going to spend a lot of time fluttering all the way left then all the way right the whole way down. So it's a slower, more elaborate fall, and it's a bigger presentation. If you're trying to mimic bigger bait fish like we talked about before, the jigging spoon does a great job of mimicking small bait. Right here, your flutter spoon does an even better job of mimicking bigger bait fish. Like I said, blueback herring, big gizzard shad, things like that. You want to try a flutter spoon. It does take a special rod and reel to get it done and get it done right. So be ready for that. Look to your seven foot medium heavies to your seven, seven, six heavy rods to do this work. So again, we talked about our major differences here. So your jig and spoon has a straighter fall. It doesn't have a scoop shape and it's a smaller size for its weight. Your flutter spoon has your wider fall. It has your heavy scoop shape and it has a larger size for its weight. And when you look at the two, basically this is how they work. This is a terrible diagram, but it kind of gets the point across. So your jig and spoon there on the left, it has a more straight flutter of fall and it comes fast. You can see it's, it kind of doesn't do a whole lot of shopping on the way down, it's there. Whereas your flutter spoon there on the right, it goes back and forth like a Christmas tree till it gets down. So depending on what you think they're doing, if they're eating those big baits and you want to give it plenty of hang time, go to a flutter spoon. If you're trying to get down to the fish with a smaller profile, go to the jig and spoon. The jig and wrap. I just got two of them in the mail the other day to try. Open water fishing is going to be interesting with these guys. So... The variables here are going to be the weight of it, the shape of it, and the color pattern. Pretty basic. These guys have been ice fishing techniques for a long, long time. It kind of embarrassed that I haven't tried them yet, but we're going to fix that problem now. So with your jig and wrap, it's a complete vertical presentation. It is straight up and down. And how they're behaved is they have you know, hooks on the ends of them, but also hooks on the belly. So you're fishing straight up and down. You don't have to worry about hanging anything. You should be able to see what you're fishing. You wouldn't throw this in cover at all. This is an open water technique. And it's basically a vertical shad hopping presentation. So you're basically going to pitch it out. Let it go to a desired depth again. Doesn't have to be the bottom. 
and you're going to lift it up and let it glide, lift it up and let it glide, lift it up and let it glide. And as it does that, it's kind of doing a little hop movement like a shad that can't quite get away from something. And it looks so lifelike with its paint jobs that those deep water fish seem to eat it pretty well. I've seen a lot of guys do well on them, and I'm jealous. I'm making myself learn how to fish it, um, and we'll see how that goes. But it could I could see it being a little staple. In my head, I would think anything from a quarter to a three-eighths ounce would be plenty unless you plan on going super deep. Then look at some of the bigger ones that are about a half ounce, and they'll get down really fast. There's no fancy flutter to this thing. It's got a V-tent in the back there you can see near the rear hook. It's, it's basically like a, a canopy over the back of it to form this little tent-shaped tail that lets it glide and, and hop around instead of just dying straight down. And I think that's what helps gives it the action of gliding around instead of tumbling that attracts the fish to eat it. So, little little jig and wrap, little jig and wrap. We're going to give it a shot and see how it works. I don't think it's going to take the place of my spoon, but we're going to give it a shot. So when you're out deep, this is what you're looking for, right? I mean, this is the hump of a river channel, a creek channel, a brush pile, whatever it is. And this is going to be a situation where you have to think about what you're going to fish. If we're going to break down this one picture right here, I'm in 22 feet of water. This is not my graph. This is a picture I just found online. I'm in 22 feet of water, right? So... What are you going to drop down there? What are you going to approach it with? What are those fish? Are they even bass? Now, you don't know. So the first thing I would drop down there to that thing would be a spoon. Honest, perfect, drop a spoon. It's going to get down there fast. I'm going to drop a small spoon first. And if they're white perch, if they're crappy, if they're striper, if they're spotted bass, typically you'll find out with that smaller bait. They'll come to it first and you'll figure out if you need to stay there any longer and keep fooling with it. But that is a sure sign that you're in the right spot. Something is going on down there and there's a hump coming off the river bottom with a ton of fish around it that appear to be active. So we're gonna drop a spoon down there about 15, 20 feet and jerk it back up and see what happens. Here's where somebody did that. So they see the fish on the graph right there, if you see the 642 on the time right there, that green and yellow and red line coming out, that's a fish. So you see the spoon going down on the graph, and you see how he retrieved it. Short little hops. As you go to the right, you can go through this little timeline. He's hopped the spoon up and hopped the spoon up, and now the fish has come to investigate. You can see the fish under the spoon, and he's staying right with it, and then all of a sudden bam the fish hits it and you can see him actually winding the fish up and two or three other fish following it right there at the little number 15 having a depth finder really helps you fish open water in the winter and the summer extremely well when you can play a video game with them it makes for a fun little day with a spoon or some other type of drop bait but this is just one example where this fella knew exactly what he was doing while he was watching his graph so blade baits, everybody remembers the old the gay blade and the cicada and the silver buddy and all those guys. And Bass Pro Shops came out with that one there in the middle that I've been fishing for years. Key variables on them again, your weight, your color pattern, which isn't quite as important, your line tie position, and the retrieves you use. So the weight of it, again, you want it to be as deep enough as you can go. If you know you're going to be fishing deeper than 15, 20 feet, stay over a half ounce with it. I'd go to a half to a three quarter ounce. It's going to fall like a rock because it's a chunk of lead on a piece of metal. But again, the action of that bait fluttering back and forth is going to cause it to lift. If you wanted to fish it deeper than 20 feet consistently, don't go any lighter than a half ounce. If you're going to be around 15 or 20, you'll be all right with a half, three eighths of an ounce, something like that. But just keep in mind that you got to have enough weight to keep it down in the strike zone if you're going to fish out deep. The color pattern, again, I usually, with blade baits and metal baits of this type, I usually either have chrome or gold. 
And gold seems to show up a little bit better in dirty water than chrome does. But more often than not, what do those shad look like? They are flashy chrome bait fish. And that's what I'm going to use. That very color right there that you see. The line tie position, at least on a couple different blade baits that I've seen, including that laser minnow there in the middle that Bass Pro puts out, it has three different line tie positions there. You're going to put your line on that clip, but you have to hook it in one of those holes of that bait. Now, the further back you go, the more nose down he's going to be. Well, it depends on how you're going to fish it. If you're going to vertical fish it, that may be what you want. It's going to let it drop faster. But... If you're going to fish it horizontally, like I fish it, giving away a secret, I put my line tie clip in the very front hole of that bait, right there in the middle. Um, it holds the nose of the bait up more like a lipless crankbait, and I think it looks more natural horizontally fishing it. So, so cranking it back in, which is what I do. Usually when I fish these baits, I throw it out, let it go to desired depth again, most of the time it is the bottom. I hop it up one time and then get it moving. Get it cranking in at a nice normal speed. So I'm basically lipless crankbait fishing with this blade bait, but it stays down so much better than a lipless. And it's a lot smaller for the weight. The other trees you can do with it are dropping it and pumping it up like a spoon. You can do some fluttering where you throw it out and let it pump it way up and let it go back down, pump it way up and let it go back down across a point. I'm telling you though, for my money in the fall and in the summer around schooling fish that are offshore, letting it go to the bottom, hopping it up and keeping a nice steady retrieve deep, tough to beat, tough to beat. In the winter time, yeah, maybe you may need to fish a lot slower, a little small hops off the bottom or something like that. But this time of year, they're chasing small shad and they're chasing them hard when they're down there. It's a good choice. So if I had to get one, I'd look at getting it a three eighths to a half and being done with it. But that's my, that's kind of where I like to fish at 20 foot range, 20 to 25. Again, there's a couple different, you know, versions of it. The silver buddies there on the left has been out for years and years. The cicada there and the old gay blade there on the bottom right. It's basically a metal lipless crankbait with a chunk of lead near his chin that gives him the weight to stay down. That's what it is. But it's a great open water technique. It's kind of a hybrid between your crankbaits and your spoons that catch a lot of fish. And your deep diving crankbaits. Everybody's fish with one of these at this point in time. Your variables with this guy are going to be your diving depth, your size, your color pattern, of course, and your whether or not you're going to troll versus cast with it. So, looking at the bills of these baits, they're all straight out, right? So, all your deep diving crankbaits are all straight out the nose to get that plane going straight down as soon as you start retrieving it. You should be able to look at the bill versus the size of the bait to kind of tell how deep you're going to go without even looking at the box. So that's a little 3XD by Strike King on the top left. And you can kind of tell that that bill's not very big. Look at the split ring. So you can kind of tell that guy's not going to go much deeper than about 8, maybe 9, 10 feet max on 8, 10 pound line. Subsequently, the DT16 on the far right in the top, you can see how big his bill is, how far it sticks straight out. That guy's going to dive really well. The Hot Lips Express in the middle of the page there, the gray and black bait with the yellow band. Very complex, big, deep scoop diving bill. He's going to get down to about 18, 20 feet on a long enough cast. So knowing the diving depth of your crankbaits versus where you're wanting to fish is super important. If you're rolling up on a point, and you're trying to hit a spot on that point 17 feet deep, you got to know what bait will even do that. Uh, are the fish looking up enough to use a 12-foot bait there? Are they hunkered down on the bottom rooting around eating crawfish or gobies or whatever's out there? Bait fish, shad, all that. Where did your crankbait have to hit? Does it have to hit it the whole time? Or just at one point in time? Because your crankbait's going to make an arch, an upside-down arch underwater. 
And you got to know that. You got to know boat positioning. You got to know how long your cast needs to be and where it needs to go. So that falls into your size. Having a crankbait that's big enough to get down where you want is sometimes more important, more often than not, than having it the exact size of the bait fish itself. The color patterns most of the time are going to be bait fish. You will find some sunfish and crawfish patterns. But more often than not, if we're throwing a deep diving crankbait, we're throwing a shad, some type of bait fish color. Get some good colors that are pretty universal. Uh, that sexy shad on the top left is hard to beat. Um, Rapala there on the top right, uh, the DT-16, have some pretty cool colors coming out now. They had very limited selection when I first started fishing a DT-16 back in 2009. Um, favorite color there was hot mustard though. Had a cool olive brown back and a yellowish belly that I thought stood out real well down deep and did real well on that color. But mimic what you want to mimic. Crawfish versus shad would be the key. I would say in the warmer months, do the shad. If you want to deep crank a little cooler, you know, in the spring and in the fall and in the winter, maybe look at crawfish then, especially if you're on a rocky point. And then trolling versus casting comes into play. And where that comes into play is in this little situation right here. So, a Bandit 300. Pretty basic, small, deep diving crankbait. It'll go about 10 to 12. But knowing its trolling chart, I guess, is what we can call this, is knowing how far the line needs to be out away from your rod tip with a 10 pound test monofilament line, which you see up there in the top right of this graph, to get down to the deep, the depth you need it to get to. So a Bandit 300 on a cast with 10 pound mono is probably only going to get to about eight or nine feet. It, it's just not you can't throw long enough, most of us can, I can't, for it to have time to get down before it starts coming back up. So, if you're going to troll it, this chart shows you how far out, with 10 pound mono, that line has to be before he gets to the depth you want. So, for example, if we wanted to troll this 300 down 15 feet, we're going to come down the column on the left to 15, and we're going to follow that blue line across the right until it hits the curve. And when it hits the curve, we're going to come down, and I know that I need to be about 90 feet back from my kayak when I'm paddling to get that thing down 15 feet. Now, more often than not, I don't know what 90 feet looks like, but the guys that professionally troll, they mark their line so they know how deep that crankbait is at all times. These are walleye fishermen. These are guys that do open water trolling for largemouth. These are dudes that troll really well, better than me. I just huck it out there and let some line out and start paddling. But there's a science to it, and if you want your crankbait to hit where you want it to hit while you're trolling, you'll look at some of these charts. Try to find a crankbait that's either the exact one you're using or one that's very similar to figure out what you need to do to get it where you want it. And finally, we'll just talk about lipless real quick. Again, very similar to blade baits. Um, pretty much just a, a crankbait that's going to fall. Some of them shimmy on the fall, like the red eye shad right there. Um, the rattle trap in the middle, super spot on the left, and there's a, um, a ruka shad there by Spro in the bottom right. Um, the weight and the size, so again, for your depth, from 15 to 20, you'd probably be just fine with a half ounce. Probably be just fine with a quarter ounce if you're about 15 or less. You're going over 20 feet, you need to look at going to at least a half, if not a three-quarter ounce lipless crankbaits. Again, they're going to loft on you. 
when you're cranking them in, when you're ripping them in. So just keep that in mind. That 15 to 20, think about a half ounce. Further than that, you're probably going to want to go up to three quarters. So the shape in the fall, most of them are very similar shapes. They're that diamond shape. The red eye shad's a little different in that it's got a, a different little forehead and nose to it. And the key is they've designed the red eye shad, that bait there on the right, the sexy shad color with the red eye. It has a little pot belly to it. So when you drop that bait, it does shimmy on the fall. And I have not seen another lipless crankbait that'll do what it does. Um, I've tried pretty much all of them that you see here and some more. And that red eye shad does a good little shimmy on the fall. So it's not just a dead action. Um, the color pattern, again, here you're mimicking shad. You can mimic crappy, sunfish, stuff like that. But you're mimicking a shad with this guy. So pick a good universal shad color, depending on your water clarity, depending on your shad size. Um, and you'll be just fine. And your retrieves are huge with a lipless crankbait. It can be fished any depth you want. So if you just want to chuck and wind, you can do that. Throw him out, let him get to a desired depth, pop him one time to get him moving and keep it cranking. And you will catch fish like that, I promise. That's how the old school boys used to do it in the springtime. They'd throw a lipless crankbait up shallow and just crank all day long and do great with it. In the summertime, though, more often than not, you're going to be fishing open water schools of shad, schools of fish on them. If they are schooling over deep water, that's great. You can pretty much fish any way you want. But if they're out deep and they're on the bottom, let them go all the way down. And instead of just cranking them back, give it a nice sweep up and let it fall back. And sweep up and let it fall back. And that's going to draw those fish off the bottom to come up and eat. And typically, if there's more than one down there, you're going to get the whole school fired up. And you'll be able to catch four or five fish while you're sitting there. But then again, you got to think about how deep you're going to fish. So that means how big and how heavy that bait's going to be. And then still trying to mimic the bait fish you want to mimic. So all this comes into play when you're fishing deep. The main thing as I leave this screen right here and finish this class is fishing deep requires more weight than you think because of the action of the lures you use and how you retrieve them the entire time you're working against them because you're bringing the line back to the reel and you have to keep that in mind you have a limited amount of line out there when you make your cast and you click your bail over or you click your spooling gear you're taking it away from that depth that you want to be fishing so you have to keep that in mind go out deep Try to get you a depth finder if you don't have one and graph around a little bit. Try to find some fish out deep and try some new techniques to approach catching them. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, they won't be out deep very long. Uh, we're in August now here in North Carolina. We got about another month of this mess before these fish start moving shallow. So if you can stand the heat, if you get out there and you can fish and that sun's not killing you too much, Fish up shallow in the morning. Go fish your top waters. Go pitch a jig to a tree. Go fish a worm under a dock. And when it gets hot, get you a cold drink. Paddle around or crank your motor up and drive around and see if you can't find some fish offshore that ain't nobody else fooling with. And try some of these techniques out deep. And if you catch something on it, let me know. I'd love to hear somebody trying something new and catch some fish on it. I've been doing it a long time, experiment with new things, and it's a lot of fun. It's hard turning you back on the bank. Bass fishermen don't do that very well. I know I don't. But when you get on a pattern out in the middle of nowhere, nobody else is doing it. It's kind of fun. So at least give it a shot. <coughs> I'd like to thank everybody again for the support. I love doing these classes. I enjoy going over all the things I've learned and all the things I think that y'all would at least enjoy trying. Um... I put these videos up uh, not only on the uh, the Facebook page there for the Brostab Bass Class, but also share them on the Hardcore Kayak Fishing Team page, as well as uh, obviously their home right there at the Ferg Fish account on YouTube. Next class will be in September. Um, going to figure out what are going what we're going to do next. We've gone through the whole gamut, and. Um, Time to dive in headfirst to something new. If there's something new you'd like to hear me talk about, 
feel free to holler at me on Facebook or even comment on the YouTube video here. And uh, we'll, we'll dive a class right into it if you want it. So thanks again, guys. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something about deep water techniques you can use. And uh, good luck out there. Try to stay cool. Catch you some bass. Thank you.